Our final speaker this afternoon, Dr. Jennifer Murray, will present from These Honored Dead, Gettysburg and World War II. As America mobilized into an arsenal of democracy, World War II further defined the Gettysburg battlefield. The warriors influenced the battle's landscape, its resources, and Americans' connection to the battle and Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Dr. Murray, an assistant professor in the history department at the University of Virginia's College at Wise, specializes in United States history, Civil War, Reconstruction, military history, Southern history, and public history. She has written numerous articles, papers, and books. Her most recent book titled, On a Great Battlefield, The Making, Management, and Memory of Gettysburg National Military Park was nominated for the Lincoln Prize, Tom Watson Brown Prize, and the U.S. Army's Distinguished Book Award, and won the coveted Batchelder Coddington Award. Dr. Murray was awarded the Summer Workshop on Analysis of Military Operations and Strategy Fellowship at Columbia University in 2014. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jennifer Murray. Thank you, Chris Gwynn, and to Sacred Trust, I always appreciate you attending this event, and happy 4th of July. You're all braving the weather. Yes, happy birthday, America. Braving the weather and the rain, having a good anniversary thus far? Yep, yep. fantastic. And you're hanging around for the last Sacred Trust presentation of the day. Yes. Very good, very dedicated individuals. Well, what I want to talk to you about today is a chapter or a subtopic from my book, which Chris mentioned, On a Great Battlefield, um, The Making, Management, and Memory of Gettysburg National Military Park, starting in 1933 and moving to 2013. And I always like to ask this question when I open up my program, and uh, some of you have already heard this little fact before, but it's, it's really interesting. It puts the Battle of Gettysburg in great perspective and in the scholarship. But for the three-day battle, how many books do you think have been written on the Battle of Gettysburg since 1863? So my repeat attendees, don't steal the thunder and shout it out, all right? So. Oh, that's close. Any other guesses? So 150 years, how many books do you think have been written on a 72 period, 72 hour period in history? What's some other guesses? I like my students, so, so shout it out. <laughs> Let me guess, 10,000, a little bit less. Park people, give it a shout. Green and gray. 9,988. There we go, that's close. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Philip, for playing along. Um, it's about 6,000. About 6,000. That's incredible amount of attention given to a 72-hour period in American history. So what my book looks at is the history of the battlefield and the landscape and how the landscape has changed over time. And specifically, what we'll talk about today is Gettysburg, the 1863 battlefield, and how World War II impacted Gettysburg, the interpretation of Gettysburg, the landscape, and then rejuvenated this interest in Abraham Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address. So to catch us up to 1940, 1941, uh, just a few quick points so we have some context. The Battle of Gettysburg, July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 1863, resulted in 51,000 casualties, killed, wounded, or captured. And immediately after the battle, four months later, Lincoln delivers the Gettysburg Address, and preservation efforts had already begun within just a few short months after this battle. And what my book chronicles is the era administered by the National Park Service from 1933 to the present. Um, prior to that, there are two preservation entities here at the Gettysburg Battlefield. In 1864, the first preservation entity will take form, and that's the Gettysburg <coughs> Battlefield Memorial Association. And this is unique because look at the date that the GBMA starts preserving the battlefield, 1864. What's going on in 1864? Yeah, the war's still going on. So local citizens, politicians had the foresight to start to preserve the battlefield and they will manage it until 1895, at which time they turn over 522 acres to the United States War Department, the first federal government presence here in Gettysburg, and the War Department will manage the battlefield until 1933. And in 1933, the National Park Service gains control of Gettysburg National Military Park and 52 other sites. Um, the other big cannonball parks, Antietam, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, and Vicksburg, Shiloh, taken over by the National Park Service at this time as well. So National Park Service here in 1933, the image, the um, su first superintendent is shown on the left of the screen. This is a 1938 reunion image. This is James McConaughey. 
and the National Park Service here at Gettysburg will acquire 2,530 acres, about 24 miles of park road and the basic infrastructure here in 1933. Now, the timing of this transition is important because for context, what's going on in the United States in the early 1930s? What would be going on in 1933? Oh, you all know you took your US history survey. They're still retaining your information. It's fantastic. Yeah, the Great Depression is going on. And ironically, the Great Depression is good, or the National Park Service benefits from the Great Depression. All the modern infrastructure comes from Roosevelt's New Deal initiatives. The uh, comfort stations, the West End, South End guide station we have on the battlefield, the restructuring of the roads, all that's done with New Deal money. And at this time, so the 1930s is a, a watershed period for the National Park Service, and at this time, the National Park Service uh, will administer 159 sites by 1941. So on the eve of the Second World War, the National Park Service is becoming a, a national agency or a national entity. Uh, the National Park Service is established in 1916, and now it finally takes control of historic as well as cultural sites. Now, oh, in context, and then moving into the substantive part of our lecture today, what's going on around the globe in 1940? So situate Gettysburg and World War II in context, what's going on around the world by 1940? Yeah, when does Hitler come to power? See, you didn't think you would be quizzed in this last <laughs> afternoon of the Sacred Trust program. Always the professor, ready to test. Yeah, Hitler comes to power in 1933. This eminent growth of totalitarianism in Europe specifically and think of the progress of Hitler's march by 1940. What countries has he gobbled up already? Yeah, the Sudetenland, Austria, Poland by 1939. So this transition moving into the Second World War for the United States. What's going on in Japan, the similar rise of expansionism through the Pacific. And the United States is remaining isolationist. So as world ablaze, Around Europe, Roosevelt is isolationist. We're doing land lease, but the United States is still very much not involved in what's going on around the world. Hitler turns his attention. This is, of course, two famous photos from the Battle of Britain in Operation Sea Lion in the summer of 1940 to try to conquer Britain, which never comes to fruition. And Roosevelt remains adrift. Roosevelt meeting with Churchill in the summer of 1940. What changes this isolationist perspective for the United States, of course, is December 7th, 1941. And that's where we'll pick up what's going on at Gettysburg at that time. The United States is jolted from its isolationist perspective. A Japanese very famously quoted, you have awakened a sleeping giant. And for the next four years, the United States, and specifically the Gettysburg battlefield, will feel the hard hand of war and the imprint of war and reshape and redefine what Gettysburg meant to the 1940s Americans, how we interpret Gettysburg, how they remember it, how they interpret and remember the Gettysburg Address. The war impacts the park's daily operations, the infrastructure, the monuments, and the commemoration of this three-day battle. So if you would go back in time and you would transplant yourself in Gettysburg, say in 1941, what kind of battlefield would you have seen? What does this place look? like in 1941. I told you the National Park Service acquired 2,500 acres, so in terms of landscape, it's pretty much intact, at least the key parcels of terrain, to what you would have seen in 1941. Uh, this is an aerial photograph looking towards the southern end of the battlefield. And I'll sort of point out a few things here as we go along. Anything definable or noteworthy about this picture you can point out? Yeah, lots of trees. Look how wooded the landscape is, right? A lot of trees. You can see the Pennsylvania Monument, so sort of orient yourself on that. You see the American flagpole? Find Hancock Avenue and look to the right of it on our image. The American flagpole at the, at the angle, eight flags prominently would be flown or displayed over the battlefield during the 1940s, American flags. 24 miles of Park Road, the interpretation decidedly Confederate in a lot of ways, and I'll get to that point in a minute. And the National Park Service in the 1940s is driven in part towards promoting tourism. Now, I think this would make my green and gray colleagues cringe today in a lot of ways if you would see your superintendent promoting 
We are in the Taurus business today in 2015, right? Will make us all recoil today. But in 1941, that's the National Park Service philosophy. McConaughey leaves, he's transferred to Vicksburg, and the second park su superintendent comes in, which is James Coleman. Coleman is a good guy. Um, in a lot of ways, he has a PhD in history, which it's in itself, in my mind, makes him a good guy. But uh, that aside, he's a, he's a very good superintendent, and he will be here until the middle part of the 1950s. So Coleman is very influential in shaping the interpretation of the Gettysburg battlefield. Anyone recognize where this image is taken? Yeah, that's the Peace Light Inn. So out on the day one field, a hotel very prominently stood and dotted the landscape for the better part of three decades. Again, driven towards tourism and tourism activities, getting as many people here as possible. This is a view, aerial view of the Peach Orchard, the Millerstown Wheatfield Road intersection. Anything striking on that? Look towards the top right of the image and find the Pennsylvania Memorial. Okay. Yeah, so look to the look to the foreground, there are no trees in the peach orchard. What's striking? I mean, you remember I'm visiting the battlefield over time. Look how many changes you yourself witnessed in your own repeated visit visitations here. Emmitsburg Road used to be cluttered or littered, a proliferation of different commercial businesses. Look at all the commercial businesses and venues up the Emmitsburg Road. Very much driven towards tourism and promoting tourism. So the National Park Service now is fo focused on, in the 1940s, making Gettysburg attractive for tourism, making it an enjoyable experience, and making the battlefield accessible. A lot of the National Park Service philosophy is driven towards making these acres utilitarian. And you see that come out in the Second World War, that the battlefield is to be used. It's to be preserved, but it is also to be used. And that's why you see World War II take shape here to the way that it does. Visitor amenities and tourism, ple pleasure. This is a little round top. 1941, the National Park Service installs its first coin-operated scenic viewer. <laughs> right? Apparently, if, and based on the previous photos I showed you earlier, you could look through that and have a great view of a lot of trees. But pop a nickel in and you could go through a scenic viewer. Now these aren't only at Gettysburg either, and you can see some of these points come out in my book, but to show how exceptional or unique Gettysburg is, look at some of the other Civil War parks and see what's going on there. Shiloh, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, Vicksburg, they all had scenic viewers installed. Uh, the National Park Service makes money off of this. The government likes to make money off of things, of course, and two months later they're going to put one in at the angle, so near where Cushing's battery is, so you'd have a scenic viewer installed there later that summer. So this is April 1941, and what the National Park Service is doing simultaneously is preserving the landscape in some small-scale rehabilitation efforts, landscape changes. This, of course, is um, Cemetery Ridge. If you can identify or point out the Meade headquarters there, it's what we're looking at. Look at the tree lines again, very heavily wooded, thick foliage, very different than what you would see in the decades thereafter. One of the first landscape changes that come along to the Gettysburg battlefield is going to be a philosophy that holds that the battlefield should look as closely as possible to what it did in 1863. Now, if you follow the history of the park in the recent years, you know a lot of controversy over Superintendent John Latcher's program to rehabilitate the battlefield to what it looked like at time of the battle. The park's general management plan called for removing over 500 acres of non-historic woodlot. Follow all that controversy that blew up in the late 1990s, early 2000s about the Park Service cutting down trees. Remember those conversations? It's not new. It wasn't new. And the Park Service did its first removal of non-historic trees in the 1940s during the World War II era. This is a neat photograph. And what is missing in the Soldiers National Cemetery? Again, look how wooded it is. But what is not there, what would you have not have seen in 1941? Whose graves would have been missing? Yeah, all the World War II, yeah, the late 20th century. So you're seeing there the annex, we would call it today, 
is not there. It's all heavily wooded landscape, all heavily wooded landscape. So the National Park Service starts to reclaim or promote areas to look like what they did in 1863. And they'll take on an initiative to make the areas that are really popular, you know, certain areas of the battlefield, like today, were popular in 1941. Little Round Top, always popular. The Angle, talking about Pickett's Charge, always popular. The southern end of the battlefield, popular vis visitation as well. And in 1940, the National Park Service does its first removal of non-historic woodlots. So cutting down trees that were not there in 1863. And there were clear-cutting initiatives at Devil's Den, Little Round Top, the Wheat Field, and along West Confederate Avenue. So you would, have starting to, you would have start to have seen a battlefield that looked more closely or mirrored what the soldiers saw in 1863. The Park Service undertakes its first initiatives to restore or uh, rehabilitate historic structures. What you're looking at in the image, did I, did I do so? Okay, um, is Meade's headquarters. You can see the Meade headquarters sign, which you won't see today, to the left of the image. Rehabilitating that, they planted the uh, peach orchard, the Sherfy peach orchard in December 1941. They would start to replant or reposition historic orchards during the Second World War II. So an idea about restoring the park to its historic configuration that we have today is, is in fact not new. This is something that Coleman's administration had been doing for decades. Now, one of the things that was pretty interesting to me in researching for my book was how much autonomy individual site superintendents and managers have. And Gettysburg is managed um, in the 1940s by Coleman with relatively o little oversight. What Gettysburg did would not necessarily parallel a larger National Park Service philosophy or a doctrine or some sort of pedagogical approach. But in 1943, the National Park Service director issues a blanket uniform statement, the first agency-wide statement on managing historic landscapes, to put it back to how the site looked at the time of its event. So here in July, 1863. So eventually, you would see this wooded landscape being thinned or being cold. Look how wooded, I know there's controversy now about the National Park Service not cutting down trees on Little Round Top that are impeding views along walkways. Weeds, sorry, not trees, weeds, weeds, big weeds, big weeds, Chris, Chris. Uh, but this is what you've got. That's, that's Little Round Top and that's Big Round Top. Look how wooded Cemetery Ridge in the southern end of the battlefield would have been. Now, the National Park Service also works to remove non-historic features, so simultaneously you have like the Peace Light Inn going up, the image that I showed you, but they're also working to preserve non-historic features and to retain and control what something looked like at the time of the battle. This is a view of Hancock Avenue looking south where the Round Top Railroad bed cross. So find Hancock Avenue and looking perpendicular parallel is the Round Top Railroad bed, which the National Park Service acquires in 1944 and will uh, remove and then rehabilitate that piece of terrain to what it looked like in 1863. So in short, if you're touring the battlefield in 1941 on the eve of World War II, you would have seen in, in terms of configuration a battlefield that had some similarities to what we see today, but also a lot of divergence. So continuity and change. Now, in terms of any interpretation or overarching interpretive philosophy, the National Park Service continues a trajectory of reconciliation. And today, with all the controversy and the outcry about the place of the Confederate flag, battle flag in public places, how it should be interpreted, preserved, or where it should be displayed, again, these debates are not new. And if you would have come to Gettysburg during the Second World War, you would have found an interpretive philosophy that was very much pro-Southern. This is something the veterans created themselves, the 1913 reunion, the 1938 reunion, the hands across the wall, very much reconciliation with deliberate effort to ignore the war's causes and controversies. And in the 1940s, Americans still buy into that interpretation. They still buy into that philosophy. The guy on the left of the image is Douglas Southall Freeman. Familiar name, Douglas Southall Freeman, um, Virginian. 
At this time, the uh, Douglas Southall Freeman has already published his three-volume, multi-volume Lee biography. Lee's Lieutenants is coming down the line. The Virginia Memorial, one of the most visited places on the battlefield in the 1940s. So this surge of Confederate interpretation is still very prominent in the 1940s here at Gettysburg. So the Virginia Memorial goes up in 1917 and the Confederate initiative to install a, a monument that pays tribute and honors and dedicates Lee's right-hand man at the battle, James Longstreet. And you all drive down West Confederate Avenue and you stop at Pitzer's Woods, you see Longstreet's memorial, right? So tiny little Longstreet and the big horse. There's plans to put a memorial up to James Longstreet in 1941. And in fact, um, Helen Dorich Longstreet and the Longstreet Memorial Association take an initiative to raise, it's to be $200,000 as to what the monument is going to cost. And it was, the site was actually dedicated down at Warfield Ridge, so stop seven on the auto tour, down on the second day's field. The site's dedicated in July 1941, July 1, 1941. Huge fanfare. This is um, the old National Park Service Visitor Center, the Rosensteel Museum. A parade for the dedication of the Longstreet Memorial. Very prominent dignitaries would attend to include the famous actress of the silent films, the 1920s, 30s, and early 40s, Mary Pickford. She's actually on the um, speaker's platform, or the list of distinguished guests up in the rostrum. Uh, if you look to the left of the image, look at a mock-up of what the Longstreet Memorial would have looked like had it went up. Uh, raising $200,000 in the 1940s very quickly is going to put fiscal constraints on you. So what happens to the Longstreet Memorial? It's scrapped, and he gets the tiny little horse, right, in Pitzer's Woods with the big Longstreet. But that's what it would have looked like. That's what it would have looked like. So the point, though, is not that Longstreet gets screwed and gets a lousy monument, but um, <laughs> which is, that's a legitimate takeaway, though. That's OK. <laughs> Confederate emphasis, right? Our interpretation of a Confederate, uh, very much a, a Confederate narrative. And what reinforces the National Park Service interpretive trajectory towards a high watermark pro-Confederate leaning is the acquisition of the Gettysburg Cyclorama. And the Gettysburg Cyclorama comes to Gettysburg um, decades earlier. It's here for the reunion in 1913, but it's in private hands. And if you would have seen the Cyclorama in 1930 or even 1942, you would go to East Cemetery Hill, and that's where the Cyclorama was viewed. But in 1942, the National Park Service acquires it. Um, out of private hands and makes it the central point of their interpretive platform. And what this does is it reinforces a Confederate trajectory. You know, Cyclorama, the big 360 degree oil painting that very much glorifies Pickett's Charge, now is very much, as the National Park Service person is telling us, the most important exhibit that we shall ever have. So reinforcing reconciliation, very much a narrative of Gettysburg and World War II. Now, to this point about the battlefield being utilitarian, so you have this, this duality. The National Park Service has to preserve a historic landscape, but at the same time, the federal government wants to use a historic landscape. And during the Second World War, the battlefield has various utilitarian purposes. Who, who's coming to the battlefield in the 1940s anyways? By 1943, 1944, who would be coming to the battlefield? Yeah, so Battlefield Gettysburg specifically very much used for training purposes. The National Park Service headquarters is down on Baltimore Street at this time. You know where the library, the old post office building is? That's where the National Park Service headquarters are. And in January 1943, they only recorded 84 visitors to the battlefield. So. Yeah, well, and that's so Roosevelt by 19, the spring of 1943 has put in gas rationing, which very much uh, leisure driving, as it would be called, which very much influences who is coming here. And even of that, Superintendent Coleman said of this, 95% of them are military personnel. 
So if you would have come to the battlefield in the 1940s just circumstantially as a civilian, you would have seen the battlefield being overwhelmed by officers or um, enlisted personnel on various training exercises. And there is a slate of good historic images of officers various places around the battlefield. Now, Gettysburg's not unique in this respect either. The National Park Service as a whole in the 1940s will make sacrifices in various ways. Uh, Western parks particularly are used for resources. Uh, mining of salt, the National Park Service will do in um, Death Valley. Um, different Civil War sites will host different sorts of military camps. So Gettysburg's not necessarily unique in that way either in context. But here you can see a photograph. This is a 1943 image of one of the park guys, uh, perhaps Fred Tilburg. It's, I can't identify it, but talking to a slate of officers um, here at the battlefield. So to the point of context, um, Chickamauga Chattanooga is going to host a WAC camp. This is the Women's Army Auxiliary. Over 46,000 women will be at Chickamauga Chattanooga between 1942 and 1945 when the camp closes. Shiloh, if you had seen Shiloh in the 1940s, Shiloh was popularly used for field artillery maneuvers. So you would have had field artillery demonstrations on the Shiloh battlefield, but Gettysburg is the epicenter and takes the focus. A string of distinguished Military individuals will come to Gettysburg to somehow extract lessons, strategic, tactical lessons, lessons on leadership from studying the 1863 battle. This is a photograph of uh, George C. Marshall, one of the most famous and influential figures of the Second World War, visiting East Cemetery Hill. July 1941. Actually, in part, it parallels the site dedication of the Longstreet Memorial. The uh, 71st Coast Artillery will come to Gettysburg and they will encamp for five days. They'll bring about 2,000 soldiers with them and they'll put about 800 tents on the fields of Pickett's Charge. And they're here to simulate what the wartime conditions they're expecting in Europe are going to be like. So they're out there with 1940s mechanized tanks and field artillery demonstrating the conditions that they expect to see in Europe on a Civil War battlefield. This is a um, photograph of Ziegler's Grove. You can see what's now non-existent, the Ziegler's Grove op um, observation tower in the left of the image. The battlefield holding utilitarian purposes. So year after year, scores of different officers, enlisted personnel coming to extract, like I said, lessons of leadership, strategy, tactics, operations, simulating conditions to what they would expect to see in Europe. Some of my favorite photographs, uh, this is the fall in 1843. This is the fields of Pickett's Charge. If you look to the left middle, you can see the Kadori Farm, chemical warfare group during exercises on the Gettysburg battlefield. Maneuvering through the fields of Pickett's Charge, in the fall of 1943. Same series of guys simulating the same events. Now today we would look at that and see that somewhat as an abomination that you would have modern military equipment on the battlefield. Again, that's not necessarily new either. What purpose did the Gettysburg battlefield play in World War I? Exactly, Camp Colt. And that's where the initial Eisenhower connection is going to come in. They had a swimming pool in the front of the angle for the officers. Not, not necessarily new. So utilitarian purposes, the battlefield. The landscape changes so dramatically over time. It's not static. It is not static. It's a story of continuity and change. So the maneuvers are a big part of World War II, and a very tangible part of the Gettysburg World War II narrative is the scrap drives. Second World War calling on uh, scrap drives. Remember, um, FDR famously declares the United States would be, quote, an arsenal of democracy. If you need an arsenal of democracy, you need the material to do so. And the United States is outproducing more stuff than any other country in the world. Um, Liberty ships, which are on the right of the image, the United States is outbuilding Japan, so the Pacific, the island hopping campaign. The United States is outbuilding Japan in, in naval vessels at a ratio of 16 to 1. 
For every one naval vessel that Japan is building, the United States is building 16. Where are you getting the material to do so? In part, and it's going to come from Civil War landscapes doing their part for the war effort. Gettysburg, we'll get to in a moment, but just as a point of context and comparison, um, Vicksburg, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, Shiloh, all donating tons of material to the war drive, the war effort, to the scrap drive. Vicksburg, by the fall of 1942, is devoted over 25 tons of interpretive markers. Chickamauga, Chattanooga, much bigger park, much bigger park, has logged over 205 tons of miscellaneous uh, metals to the scrap drive. Now at Gettysburg, the War Department had uh, stockpiled a fair amount of cannons, non-Civil War cannons to be included, so the War Department has a huge, or had a huge arsenal that the National Park Service inherits. So when the war comes along and the federal government is promoting this scrap drive and the Secretary of Interior is passing it down the ranks, Coleman gets his directive, there's surplus material to give to the scrap drive. Right? They're not roaming cannons and taking cannons off the battlefield. They have scrap drive. What they would take off the battlefield, in part, are some of the commemorative features. And the National Park Service manages two landscapes. You have the historic landscape, the battlefield itself, what was here in July of 1863. And then you have the commemorative landscape, which is the post-1863 structures that the veterans would put up to commemorate the battle here in July of 63. So the commemorative features, like you see in this photograph, are in part what would have been scrapped to the drive. Um, this is an old... 1900 photograph of some of the, this is Devil's Den, some of the bollards that had been donated to the scrap drive. The ornamental features would be removed. Um, this is a better photograph of that. This is um, the saddle between Upper and Lower Culp's Hill. And you can look on the bottom left of the image and see some of those bollards. So they're put up by the War Department to keep people on the roads, right? These are safety features that are put up in this instance and then scrapped during the Second World War. So look at what the National Park Service here at Gettysburg is starting to scrap or salvage. September 1942, the park here has donated 18 tons of scrap metal. They've taken iron fence posts, panels, signs, surplus guns. Um, 18 of these surplus guns are taken to Antietam. And they're loaded up and put it on a train and sent down to Antietam. And Antietam displays them for their interpretive program on the battlefield during the Second World War. And then over 800 spherical shells. There would be those pyramid-type shells that you used to see outlaying next to the guns. They are going to be disassembled and donated to the scrap drive. There's a couple photographs of um, workers loading up these ornamental or commemorative features and sending them off to be used in the, the makings of materiel for the Second World War. So Gettysburg as an arsenal of democracy. I love the government bureaucrat there standing with his hands on his <laughs> hips, right? That's right, boys, you do the work. Sorry. You know I love you guys. Now, where this rubber starts to meet the road, all right? So think of the context, 1942. This is um, early American efforts in North Africa, 1943. The war is increasing in intensity, and more stuff is needed for the American war effort. Think of Lend-Lease. You have Lend-Lease products going all around the world for Allied soldiers to stop the Japanese and the Nazi expansion. So the superintendent at Gettysburg is given a directive that he needs more stuff. So they go around and they start to itemize the battlefield. It's like doing an inventory here at Gettysburg and seeing what exactly can be scrapped and salvaged. And in October 1942, the superintendent goes around and he says, okay, if push comes to shove, we can donate or, and, and scrap 19 of the itinerary tablets. And these are what would have been, um, they're Union and Confederate, and they had a narrative or a summary of different units to, or units to the battle. And here's Coleman's point. We can remove these without any serious interference with the visitor's understanding of the battle. Superintendent Coleman says that they do nothing to the existing interpretive program. Put up in the 1880s by the Union Confederate veterans, doesn't see any relevance to them for the modern era, 
and push comes to shove, we're going to scrap it. But what else is here that you can scrap besides 19 itinerary tablets? What do we got? We got all the statues and all the monuments. Though, so get to the fun stuff. Don't worry about these little bollards, right? Let's start dismantling the entire commemorative structures of the park. And the National Park Service will put together a, uh, it's called a preliminary report on non-nefarious metals at Gettysburg in the winter of 1942. And they go around, the superintendent and staff will go around and inventory what can be scrapped and salvaged. And they put it into nine categories. It's, um, number one is what could be scrapped first. Number nine is, dear God, I hope it doesn't come to that. That's what we really want to save. All right. So here's how they put them together. Here's our nine classifications. So we're already ready to get rid of these bronze itinerary tablets. They're at the top. They're number one to go. Push comes to shove. Number two, we can send out Civil War cannons. Fine. Number three, brigade, division, and core tablets. Number four, decorative objects on the monuments. So anything that's decorative or um, extraneous, that could be metaled, metaled down, melted down, and metaled down. That's one through four. Five to eight. Symbolic statues, number six, bronze inscriptive tablets on regimental or state markers, seven, so very low priority to scrap, high priority to save, is reliefs depicting battle scenes or individuals, and number eight are statues for individuals. So our core commander, equestrian statues, is really like Meade, Sickles, oh no wait, not Sickles, sorry, he didn't, he didn't have one, Slocum. Who are we missing? What are we missing? And this is, I'm sort of extrapolating here to make a point. The last category that the National Park Service wanted to scrap or salvage. Visitor Center? What, that, should, that, that should have been the first thing to go, right? What you want to save, right? The arsenal of democracy is not going to touch these aspects of our battlefield. Our, the three Confederate state memorials. Virginia, North Carolina, and Alabama. Now, save to their credit, as they would say, for highly artistic merit. And what the National Park Service wanted is for a photographer to go around and photograph all these monuments. And then when the war was over and you had time, you know, we'll just, we'll just rebuild them all, right? We'll just sculpt them all again and rebuild them. So, fantastic understanding of how the National Park Service looked at the landscape. And, of course, it doesn't get to that point, right? Last I, last I was over on Confederate Avenue, all three of these were still there, right? And the National Park Service steps back. This is the director at the time. This is Newton Drury. And realizes you can't go out and ask men to sacrifice the last full measure of devotion. At the same time, we're dismantling our historic structures. And they put the kibosh on that, and of course the war does not come to that intensity. So, one last point I want to make in, in the interest of time. Are we two? Okay. Um, two last points I'll make. The other famous occurrence that happens here on the, on the battlefield, and there aren't any good photographs of this, so I'll sort of mention it in passing, but for your own uh, conversation. Gettysburg also hosts a prisoner of war camp. Um, German POWs specifically will be housed on the fields of Pickett's Charge. There are prisoner of war camps all throughout the United States during the Second World War, and Gettysburg will host one 15-acre uh, camp on the fields of Pickett's Charge. Um, during the entirety of the war, there are over 500, and that's what you see dotted out here, there are over 500 POW camps in the United States holding over 400,000 German soldiers. And Gettysburg will hold about 250 uh, German POWs. This is a camp in Mississippi, and this is the one photograph I've ever been able to come across of the camp here at Gettysburg. Uh, the first German prisoners of war will arrive in June 1944. What's going on in June 1944? Yeah, D-Day. And they will be here through the duration of the war. And by all accounts, you can read, read through the Gettysburg newspapers on these matters. Um, all accounts, the Germans got along wonderfully well with the local populace. 
And if you think of the mass mobilization of small towns like Gettysburg or Adams County where men of working age are now serving in the military, you need labor for labor-intensive activities. So the Germans specifically here would be put to use in production or cultivation of, of crops. They got paid a prevailing salary, which at the time is a dollar a day, and they would be used, and to their credit, um, going through and processing pulpwood and fruit primarily. Now the other big point, or the sort of big interpretive focus or the narrative trajectory of the Second World War at Gettysburg are the uh, commemorative events, pageantry. And the Memorial Day activities during World War II are voluminous, incredibly popular, and very, very patriotic, very patriotic. Um, Gettysburg has always been a popular place for Memorial Day activities even prior to the Second World War, but now it takes on a tone where speakers will come to Gettysburg and they will ask 1940 Americans to give the last full measure of devotion. And they're connecting the 1863 landscape with what needs to be done in Europe. So heightened fanfare and reconciliation characterize the 1940 patriotic displays. And speakers come to Gettysburg and they just overwhelmingly emphasize the Gettysburg Address. All right, 272 words that is important because it's malleable. It changes over time. And if you look at what the 1940 American populace, they're, what are they reading into the Gettysburg Address? What's the famous lines to run through your mind that you would extract out? They're looking at the Gettysburg Address for? What's the one that Lincoln says about government of the people, by the people, for the people? And the federal government uses Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address for propaganda. This is a post, obviously, post December 7th. Uh, post Pearl Harbor, these men shall not have died in vain. They use it for enlistment purposes. They use uh, lines from the Gettysburg Address for liberty bonds to buy money or invest in the war effort. Lincoln's popularity skyrockets during the 1940s, rightfully so, because as millions of people around the globe are losing their freedoms and their rights, 1940s Americans read the Gettysburg Address with a whole different lens. And Lincoln's words of the people, by the people, for the people, mean a whole lot more. And that's the liberty bond. Look at the bottom of the people, by the people, shall not perish from the earth. So Memorial Day events are imbued in this heightened sensationalism, very much patriotic rhetoric, very much uh, mystic chords of memory, to borrow a line from Lincoln's first inaugural, very much fan-waving, fan American-centric, Thousands of people will attend. This is uh, May 1943, Memorial Day Parade. And the speaker, the keynote speaker, is the governor of Pennsylvania. And he offers this. Very much linking the 1863 battle and its meaning, its implications, to what needed to be done in the 1940s, what the task at hand would be. 1944, Memorial Day. Same idea, these are uh, children marching through the gatehouse of the National Cemetery along Baltimore Pike. 1944 Memorial Day is kind of neat because they have two keynote speakers. One from Massachusetts, so you got the Yankee represented, and you got your Southerner from North Carolina giving a dedication address as well. And this is what the governor of North Carolina suggests in 1944. shrine, sacred to North and South alike, very much reconciliationist sentiment. And is he encouraging unity, national unity, at a time of world crisis? In 1940, Americans visit the Gettysburg battlefield. They find hope. They find inspiration, rejuvenation. And at the end, an 1863 landscape provides the kind of comfort and solace identity, national identity, that you need to get to that point. And probably at no other place on the American landscape could you have made that connection to the past and the present than what you would find at Gettysburg in the 1940s. 
Thank you all for your participation. I appreciate it. Questions? Yeah. Any questions? Please. How did the park's budget hold up? Yeah, did it? From the government. The park always has a good budget, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 They're, uh, it's always soaring. Soaring, yeah. Uh, um, um, <laughs> lousy. It's, it's lousy, of course. Um, I think in my book, um, probably in the footnotes, I probably have some specific numbers, but off the top of my head, I couldn't sort of categorically say, but it, it is slashed. It's absolutely slashed. Yep. One question I have is, um, the country's very big. Um, why would the United States use Gettysburg, Vicksburg, Shiloh um, for, you know, utilizing um, training procedures for the U.S. military for, you know, uh, the chemical warfare I saw over there or tanks or anything like that? Um, I mean, there are tons of other locations like Camp Smith in New York, you know, things like that. Why would they use historical battlefields? I figure you want to preserve every inch of that. Yeah, in, in part, um, two ways to answer that. One, in part, they're just massive acreage. So you can bring up 800 tents and all these equipment, and you can have a large landscape to do that. And two, preservation is not a priority. And that's the important point. The National Park Service, as an agency in the 1940s, looks at historic sites for utilitarian purposes. And today, it makes us cringe, but it, it's not uncommon. And the World War I um, camp here suggests the War Department, veterans themselves, the War Department, in some ways, um, reflected the same kind of philosophy. So for all the good things in the philosophy the National Park Service has now about preservation, that is not uniform and consistent through history. Eisenhower, of course, gained major interest, interest in the Gettysburg here in, pre in preservation. Was that after the war? Yeah, he's here, of course, as a junior officer during World War I at Camp Colt, which is his first taste of Gettysburg. And is it 1950 50 he acquires the house? 50 even? Is it 1950? Yeah, he buys the property in 1950. So from what he saw here at Camp Colt, that continues as a, as a passion for him to purchase the house in 1950. Anything else? Do you have some uh, thoughts on how close the park is now to what you would like it to be? To what it was like in 1863? No, to what you think it should be. <laughs> I feel like there's a right and wrong answer to that question. Um, in, in, in disclosure, I work for the National Park Service here for 10 summers, so I have a, a sort of very invested emotional interest in this park, but fairly as a historian, this is the most fantastically um, landscape that the National Park Service does for Civil War sites. With the general management plan in the 1990s, the National Park Service here at Gettysburg put on a consistent systematic program to make the landscape look like it did in 1863, and they removed over 500 acres of non-historic trees. All the fencing patterns that are out there are consistent to what you would have seen in 1863. The orchards to where they are to what is planted there is consistent to what you would have seen in 1863. So in terms of a, a view shed that is consistent to what you would have seen or soldiers saw 150 years ago, Gettysburg is the place to be. And I can't say that other parks have been so thorough and diligent in following that trajectory. So I give him a thumbs up. What was the strangest thing that was given over to the metal collecting effort? The strangest thing? Um, I, nothing particularly strange, per se. Um, trucks would have been donated, tires. Those objects, I don't know if you consider them strange per se, but I didn't find anything that made me sort of wonder, you know, why are you donating that to the scrap drive? It's all very practical. They didn't have a purpose for us, so we can scrap it away. Now, if they would have given away the Alabama Monument, that would have been certainly this, this sort of strange point to me. But it's ex extraneous materials that fortunately were donated because the war didn't come to that point. I uh, just have one last question. The, um, I've been coming to Gettysburg since the 90s. Uh, and one thing I noticed is, uh, I would 
say commercialization. So when, when I was coming here in the 90s, uh, you, you know, you didn't have a Walmart and things like that. At least I, I didn't remember it being here. Um, how do you feel about more and more um, of commercialization of the actual town of Gettysburg with like corporate, you know, kind of things? Right. Um, Gettysburg is the most si visited Civil War battlefield. The Park Service records well over a million people here every year. So if you want people to come and visit the battlefield, you need to have things for them to do. You need to have places for them to stay, places for them to eat and shop. Have you been to Shiloh? Yeah. Okay. Anyone sort of thinking what Shiloh is like? Like you drive for days to get there and all right, and the bad Joes are playing along the river in Tennessee. I mean, it's, it's really out there, but they don't have the same kind of visitation. They don't have the amenities for it now. Gettysburg is different. It's the iconic jewel of the, of the Civil War cannon parks, and that comes with good, good and bad. And we, we all have very much opinions on that, but practically you need, you need something to draw visitors or to accommodate for visitors. What, what's in the future for the Longstreet Memorial? Is it just a dead thing or? Oh, I love your shirt. Um, yeah, it, it is. The, the He's my first fifth cousin. It, did you find that disappointing then? The Longstreet Monument that would have been and what it is now, no, nothing. I mean, that one goes up in what, 94 or five? And that's the end of any initiative to commemorate Longstreet other than what it was. In fact, the National Park Service now has a, a moratorium and you could correct me if I'm wrong, the National Park Service now at Gettysburg has a moratorium on any additional commemorative features. So every monument that's on the battlefield is it. They are tapped out. There's no more places to put anything new. Jennifer, how long was the uh, POW camp here and when did it close down? Um, I think it's April, April or May of 45. So it's, it's no more than, it opens in June 44 and then war is over. It's right at war's end. So it's a short-lived POW camp. And that's sort of consistent to the other camps across the country too. Europe just has nowhere else to put them. So they start coming over when the campaigns. Yeah. No, I don't, th I don't think so. I think it's May or June. That I could check for you and make sure I'm specific on that, but it's, it's, it would be after. Yeah, it would be after. And they only house, like I said, 250 POWs at its peak anyway. Yep. We're good? Right. Thank you all. I appreciate your attendance.